Think, think, think. Uh, all right, fine, I'll review it. What is up, everybody? Welcome to my review of Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey 2. Now, if you had asked me just a couple of weeks ago if I was planning on watching or reviewing this film, I would have told you that hell would freeze over, pigs would fly, and Hollywood would turn conservative before that was ever going to happen. But life loves to throw you curveballs. So I'm not going to get too far into it because there's plenty of videos on my channel that have this situation well documented. But for a quick little recap, if you have recently joined my channel or you're watching me for the first time, last year, just over a year ago now, when the first Winnie the Pooh Blood and Honey was released, I gave it a very negative review, a review that I still stand by to this day, and the creators, a few of the creators involved with Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey, saw my review and some of my statements made on Twitter, took big issue with it, and me and these creators had a very public spat that happened sporadically throughout the last year. And because of said feud, I had said on this channel at least once or twice that not only was I not going to review any further films in this franchise, this Pooniverse, but I was not even going to be watching or acknowledging them going forward because I was just so turned off by uh, my relationship or my interaction with the filmmakers. And a little over a week ago now, and I released a video kind of detailing the whole situation, uh, these creators from Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey, reached out to me, wanted to have a Zoom call, wanted to clear the air, and just talk face-to-face, man-to-man. And I decided to have this phone call, and the phone call, the conversation went extremely well. Uh, a lot of understanding was reached. I think there was just a lot of misunderstood passion on both sides. You know, there's a lot more to it. You can check out that video. I'll link it up here. But nonetheless, we all walked away with a newfound understanding, newfound respect for each other, and was able to get rid of and wash our hands of that very public feud and move forward amicably. And ever since that phone call and the video that I dropped detail in that phone call, I've been toying around with the notion of watching and reviewing this film. My only concern being that I was so definitive and public about the decision not to cover these films. But since that was specifically because of the feud and my negative interactions with the filmmakers, and that had since been washed away and exonerated, I started to wonder, is it worth me checking it out? Is it worth me reviewing? Or is it going to be some perceived conflict of interest because of the negative past and this newfound positive relationship with these filmmakers? And ultimately I decided, especially after having watched the film last night, that my relationship, my back and forth with uh, the people that made this film, in no way affects my thoughts on the movie. After walking out of Blood and Honey 2 and thinking of the things that I liked and the things that I did not like, it was very clear to me that that would have been exactly my thoughts regardless if that phone call and that feud had taken place or not. And I think most of my viewers that have been with me for a long time that know my character, that know my integrity, would trust fully in that. There's going to be a couple of people inevitably in the comment section that are going to go the opposite. They're going to swear that there's something else going on here, some other motivation. Whatever, you believe whatever you want to believe. I know what's in my heart. I know what my integrity and my motivation is. And with that said, let's talk about Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey 2. So essentially, this movie is kind of a soft reboot as much as it is a sequel to the first film. It's kind of an Evil Dead 2 situation where it kind of acknowledges the first film as much as it kind of erases and redoes the first film. The original Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey movie is a film within the film in this new universe. The massacre in the Hundred Acre Woods is actually something that happened, and then a group of filmmakers created a film that kind of gave their accounts of that. And so that's how the first film is framed within the canon of the second film. And so the story of the second film essentially is a picking up off of the massacre of the first film. They call it the 100 Acre Woods Massacre. And Christopher Robin is trying to move on with his life. He's got a lot of trauma and a lot of guilt and all the baggage from the events of the first film and his relationship with Pooh. And he is not able to do that because there's a certain amount of people in town that think he's a fucking nut and think that he made all this bullshit up about animals and Pooh and he's clearly the one that murdered all these people. And then you have certain people in town that do believe Christopher Robin's story and have kind of formed an angry mob to go into the 100 Acre Woods and are slowly and systematically kind of creating this isolated situation where the monsters are getting boxed in because they're hunting them and burning down the forest in the process trying to 
figure out if those monsters are actually real and kill them for revenge of the events of the first film. So it kind of creates a situation which is the, the kickoff point of the movie where Christopher Robin and Pooh are in very similar situations, kind of feeling isolated and stuck by the actions of the townsfolk. And Owl, who is one of the new characters that you get in here, who's kind of more the, the wise puppet master of this group of monsters, essentially says, okay, we're running out of options. Either we're gonna die or we're going to take the fight to these humans. And so you have the kickoff to this film. Who Ashdown views our existence as a plague, as horrors of the Hundred Acre Wood. Now, as somebody who was extremely negative on the first film, who struggled to find even one single solitary thing that I could say positive about it, I can tell you with full confidence that this sequel is a significant improvement over that first film. Basically, every single piece of the filmmaking process is better here than it was in that first film. But obviously, given my thoughts uh, on the first film, that's a really low bar to meet. So we've established that I think that this is a much better film in the first film, but can I quite get to the point where I would say that this is a good film for my taste? Let's talk about it. Starting off with the positives, this was a significantly better written film, both in story as well as the screenplay itself. Now, the story, I believe, was a collaboration between Matt Leslie and the director, uh, Reese Wader Waterfield, but the screenplay is exclusively written by Matt Leslie, if I'm not mistaken. I'm trying to remember the credits in my head. But Matt Leslie essentially is the writer of Summer of 84, a film from 2018 that I'm a massive fan of, and had I not had any issues with these filmmakers, going into all of this when they announced that he was the writer that would have actually really excited me because I really like his previous work and you can absolutely tell that there has been an upgrade in the writing ability here because there's actually a story this time you have some diving into the trauma of Christopher Robin and giving him an actual character arc and making him a character that you actually like to follow and and somewhat root for and sympathize with here whereas the first film that was not the case there's a, a few pieces here where you kind of dive into the psychology of the animals, the monsters, and figure out what their motivations are. And there's some attempts at some twists and turns throughout and some revelations regarding the origins of the monsters and some unknown details regarding their friendship back in the day with Christopher Robin uh, when he was a child. So there's a lot more things going on here narratively. So when you have sections of the movie that's not focused on massacres and carnage candy, there's more to do, there's more to grab our attention, and we're willing to go along with those slower scenes because there's actually a certain amount of intrigue built and there's a certain amount of investment in the main character. Also in regard to the main character, Christopher Robin, there is a recast and we have Scott Chambers, who is one of the producers. I believe him and Reese are kind of the main brainchild of this Pooniverse. Nonetheless, he is the newly casted Christopher Robin and I actually think he did a pretty solid job. Now, the interesting thing about it is that I've actually spoken with Scott. He was one of the people in this phone call and I'll tell you before I even saw the film, I knew that he was cast as Christopher Robin, and just from our brief interaction, Scott has this very gentle and kind demeanor about him. And so even before I saw the film, I was like, okay, it makes sense why they would cast him as Christopher Robin, because he just kind of has those qualities that I think would work for that character, or the way the character was portrayed in the children's books, and something that you would certainly want to maintain to be a bit of a tonal foil to the dark, demented side that they are taking Pooh into. So Scott's personality certainly comes out a lot to establish this new version of Christopher Robin, but there's a number of scenes where he has to get emotional and he has to get heightened. You know, horror films especially always put characters and actors through a lot of those situations, and I think he did a solid job. Definitely, again, an upgrade from what we got the first time where Christopher Robin was just running around going, oh, Pooh, I'm sorry, Pooh. What can we do, Pooh, Pooh? What are we doing, Pooh? I think the way that the villains, the monsters, the uh, animals of the 100 Acre Woods was also done significantly better here. I think that the masks and the makeup effects and everything were a gigantic step up. I was borderline insulted by the quality of the first film where it was literally just like a spirit Halloween mask on top of a random hillbilly character. And this one, they actually look more like 
humanoid animals. Pooh actually looks like a bear with human features. It actually looks like a, a rabid tiger with human features. Owl kind of has a bit of a Jeepers Creepers vibe going on with them. So I, I enjoyed that side of it much more. There's actual facial expressions that come through. The creatures are able to emote. Uh, some of them talk. So there's just much more given here than the, the silent, very cheap killers that we got in the last film. There's a lot more kills and there's a lot better kills here too. So I would assume most people that go to see this film go for the Carnage Candy. The Carnage Candy got an upgrade. There is a significant amount of very bloody and gory kills with a nice variety to them, which again was one of my major issues with the first film that we did not have that. And if we don't have that, what the fuck are we doing here? This one, you get a lot more of that. There's even a third act that's framed around this rave party that just gives tons of cannon fodder for these monsters to be able to rack up a body count to kind of cap off the film. So if you're there for the kills, you'll be more satisfied. I also like the score. There's a nice variety to the tones of music going on. There's you know, backstory sequences and flashbacks where you get a little bit more of a, a kid music flavor here and there. When you get into the third act especially and things are ramped up, it's supposed to be a lot more tension fueled. I was picking up a lot of influence from Manfredini from the Friday the 13th scores. Uh, so that's always something that fits very well with slashers, obviously. So I, I enjoyed the music and the variety of music that we got here. It was something that was certainly a standout. Overall, the film just looks a lot better. You see the budget hike on screen. You see that they're able to have a lot more resources, that there's a lot more things that they can do. And hopefully as they go forward in this Puniverse, that will continue to climb because it, it, the more they're able to do, the more the resources that they have, clearly the better the end product is. And finally, I appreciate the fact that they clearly had more fun with the concept this time around. They were pushing to have a little bit more of a self-aware tone. They were pushing to have a little bit more of a tongue-in-cheek flavor here and not taking themselves so ultra serious. There's still room to grow, and I'll talk about that here very shortly, but I do feel like this movie and the filmmakers behind it genuinely took the criticisms of the first film and tried to do as much as they could to appease all of that, to head in the direction that people almost unanimously were saying they wanted this to go. You know, whether or not they had some, some negative reactions to criticism the first time around, which they certainly did, I felt like everybody was kind of in unison with these collection of issues that we had with the first film and you feel like they actually took that to heart and they said, okay, you want all of that, we're gonna try that. You don't want any of that stuff, fine, we're gonna taper all that down. And I felt this was a genuine good direction to head. We are on the right track. But I still had a number of significant issues with this film. I, it's not quite there for me yet. I'm not completely won over by it. We're headed in the right direction. I'm enjoying where we're going much more than where we started, significantly more but we're not quite there yet for me. So with that being said, the mixed elements, one of the main ones is this backstory and this lore that we are given for the origins of these monsters and some revelations given regarding the past with Christopher Robin. Narratively, I like the ideas that we're going for here. I think that some of the revelations are interesting. I think that it kind of deepens what is going on between these characters much more so than what we were given in the first one, which was just, oh, he moved away and then they got hungry. Well, what the fuck did they eat before he came along? Nonetheless, we're not talking about the first film. The revelations that were given, the idea I liked, I just didn't necessarily love the way that they executed getting that information to the viewer. Essentially, the second act of this film is where you start to get into a lot of that. And there's literally a point where Christopher Robin goes to a specific character and gets all of the information that he needs. It's just an exposition dump scene. And that's not uncommon in films. Sometimes there's not really an organic way to have a character find out things and be shown things. They have to be told from a character but I felt the exposition dump just went on way too long. Essentially, Christopher Robin goes in, threatens this guy, wants an answer, and he just gets like two to three minutes long of this monologue of all these details of this is what happened, and then we did this, and then this happened, and then this guy did this, and then I felt this way, and then I did this, and then now this happened, and it just keeps going on and on to where I was like, ah, oh, why? Why did we have to be told all of this? Why couldn't we have found a way to, to, to show us this stuff? Because 
it's not like there weren't breadcrumbs laid earlier in the film where some viewers, certainly myself, was heading in that direction as far as a train of thought where I'm like, hmm, I wonder if it's gonna head this way. But when you just dump all this information onto us, I feel like it kind of stifles any shock value or any surprise that is there because you just are, are literally just giving dialogue, explaining everything that you, you could have had a more interesting way to show us that. Have something that he finds or have a flashback sequence that details all of it. Something. Just a guy telling all of it wasn't the most interesting way to execute that in my mind. The other mixed element is the personalities given to our villains, our monsters. In the first film, they were dialogue free, they were silent killers, there was no personality there. Here, there's genuinely an attempt to give them distinct personalities. Tigger is very much the unhinged psychopath. Owl is more the all-knowing, all-seeing puppet master of everybody. He's the one who's more the knowledgeable one, who's kind of the, the planner and telling everybody what we need to do. Pooh is essentially just the gigantic brute. There is a genuine attempt to give these monsters personalities, and again, that is heading in the right direction. They should have personalities. They should be something that is a standout to where not only do they have distinct attitudes and distinct flavors to them, but you give them one-liners, you give them these standout sequences. You want us to enjoy being around them even though they're these fucked up monsters. That's how horror works. We all go to see Halloween because we love Michael Myers, and we go to see Nightmare on Elm Street because we love Freddy. It's weird, but that's exactly why we're there. However, I feel like to a certain extent, the personalities that they are given are a little too reminiscent of already established horror icons, primarily with Tigger. Most people that watch this film, I think are gonna walk away saying uh, that Tigger is the standout here. And to an extent, he's the standout for me too, because he's the most unhinged, he's the most uh, off the wall, he's the one that kind of pops the most on screen, he's given the most one-liners, he is the one that is most enjoyable to watch, you know, giving carnage out to all of these human characters. However, I found his personality to be way too on the nose of an homage to Freddy Krueger. There's a section in the movie where Tigger's just unleashed, and I'm not joking when I say about five or six lines in a row, he ends it with, bitch. <laughs> Better watch where you go, bitch. The first time he says it, I'm like, oh, okay, cute. We're doing a Freddy Krueger thing. That, that's, that's cool. I'm a Freddy fan. I can get value out of that. But when you do it two, three, four, five times in a row, it just feels too on the nose. And I think it opens them up to, yet again, the criticism of being a bit unoriginal. Like, I would want these characters to have distinct personalities, more so than mirror other horror icons that are much more beloved. Even Owl, to an extent, more, more so because of the voice modulation that they choose to use to give him a very dark bravado when he talks, I was getting Pinhead vibes the entire time. Even though, visually, he has nothing in common with Pinhead, Something about the inflection of his voice and the, the dark, macabre nature of what he's saying kind of mixed with the more cerebral, intelligent side that he's coming from, it felt very pinhead to me. So I would just caution with that. It's awesome that we're giving them personalities. We need to go further with that. But I just let's temper down the, the homage, if you will, a bit. And now moving on to the negatives. Uh, one of the main ones that I had very early on in the film is that the film is extremely dark and not tonally, just lighting wise. Now I did talk with a friend of mine that watched the movie last night too and he said that he didn't have that problem at all. So it is possible that this is something that's gonna depend on your theater. It's absolutely a fact that the, the brightness of a projector can make a difference in that department. But it's also a well-known fact that sometimes when you're working with lower budgets, especially in horror, taking the lighting down a bit can obscure and hide some of the restrictions of the budget that they're working with. So it very easily could just be that, and this is what most people are gonna experience when they see the film. But there's a number of kills, there's a number of makeup effects, there's a number of things going on that just literally were too dark for me visually to kind of discern what exactly was going on. Also, despite the fact that we get more kills and the ones that are standouts, I think are, are much better this time around, there's also a number of kills that are cutaways or they use shadows to visually show you what's happening or they switch perspectives where as the actual act is happening, you're just seeing the killer doing his thing and then you just see a shot of the aftermath. Again, budgetary restrictions. I understand all of that. That has to be taken into account. But for a slasher film where the carnage is the main draw for most of us, 
too much of that in this movie in my mind. It, it was a bit of a blue balls effect sometimes where you get really good practical effects and then sometimes when you don't get to see the kill, you're like, man, fuck. I wanted to see that one. They've also stuck with the decision to make Winnie the Pooh a silent killer. Despite the upgrade in personalities of everybody else, Piglet included, Winnie the Pooh is still kind of the Michael Myers, Jason Voorhees of the group where he just walks around, doesn't say anything, and just emotes facially. And I gotta say, I don't agree with that decision. Uh, I, I understand that you kind of want to have some variety in there, especially since they're, they're very directly paying homage to other popular horror icons with their Winnie the Pooh monsters. But if you're gonna have everybody else be such distinct personalities and get one-liners and stand out much more as characters, I think it does poo a bit of a disservice to not have him be able to do all of that. And inevitably what you're gonna have if you know when we get Winnie the Pooh Blood and Honey 3 or the, the Monsters Assemble movie is that the poster child of this universe is gonna inevitably be the least standout and maybe even the least interesting character of the bunch. So I, I would push more in the direction that you went with Tigger and with Owl and give Pooh some one-liners and give Pooh a personality. But my main issue with the movie, despite the fact that this is a much more fun experience, that they're leaning harder into that, there's one-liners, there's more personality, or we're heading in the direction of where things need to go, I still think we need to make giant strides going more towards the fun side. I mean, we're talking about Winnie the Pooh and Piglet and Tigger fucking people up in gory ways. Like, this needs to be a riot. This needs to be a film or a universe where it's just absolute zany fun start to finish. I still think there's way too many segments in the movie where they're being ultra serious, where they're diving into trauma, and there is still a bit of a mean-spirited streak in some of the kills where it's more about just the pain and the torture of the victims, and less so about the, the zany, ridiculous, over-the-top gore. There were a number of moments in this movie where I genuinely thought, this is fun. We're having fun now. The one-liners are good. The, the kills are zany. It's over-the-top. Like, we're, we're embracing the silly now, but I just want more of it, which is kind of the best criticism you can get is that what you gave me, I want more of that. Like if we have a scale here that goes from serious to fun, the first film was hard on this direction. The dial was all the way this way. There was no fun to be had. We were just ultra dark, mean spirited seriousness. Now we've pushed it more towards the middle with this sequel, but if it was my choice, I would max that bitch out. Like we started with the tone of something serious like the original Nightmare on Elm Street. We're heading in the tone of something like Dream Warriors where we're, we're having some fun, there's some tongue in cheek acknowledgement of what's going on, but we're still trying to be serious and dark and fucked up. We need to go like Freddy's dead level ridiculous in my opinion. So that was the biggest opportunity that the, the film left on the table for me was that we're heading in that direction. I like more of what we're doing but we need to keep heading in that direction, especially if we're gonna build towards a movie called Pooniverse Monsters Assemble. By the time we get there, we need to just be having a blast with what's going on and let go a lot of the, the, the darker, more serious elements. Overall, this is what I'll say. If you're somebody that somewhat enjoyed or really enjoyed the first film, I have a hard time believing any of you will not like this one significantly more. If you're somebody that didn't quite enjoy the first film, but you saw some potential there, there's a chance that this one might win you over. But if you're somebody that just absolutely is not on board for this, or you detest the first film on a level where you just ha have this built-in block to any potential of what is going on with an evil Winnie the Pooh, I don't think there's enough here that's going to win you over, at least not yet. As somebody who was extremely negative on the first one, I enjoyed this one a good bit more. I like where we're heading. I think that there is much more potential to win over more target audience members with the future of this if we keep heading in this direction. But is Winnie the Pooh Blood and Honey 2 a movie that I can honestly say is a movie that I thought was good, that I would recommend to a lot of people or has completely won me over on this concept? No, we're not quite there yet, but we're getting there. Well, that's it for this one, guys. If you enjoyed that, please click over here for all of my 2024 new release reviews. I'm also going to put that video kind of detailing the resolution with me and some of these filmmakers up here for you to check out if you're interested. Like, share, hit that subscribe button if you want to see everything in the future. And as always, remember, opinions are like assholes, but that doesn't mean you have to be.